Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of ISO 45001-2018, where we will provide a overview of the OHS standard. My name is Austin Matthews. I am the EHS Program Manager with PJR. You'll find an agenda on this slide. We will begin by talking about Perry Johnson Registrars, who we are, what we do, We'll highlight some of the benefits of certification to an OHS standard like ISO 45001. We'll cover the key requirements of the standard at a high level and then go a little bit more depth in um, with a clause by clause overview. We'll cover some related requirements um, outside of the standard document themselves, but uh, applicable to occupational health and safety systems. And we'll also provide an overview of the certification process for new clients or clients pursuing initial certification to ISO 45000 for the first time. We'll close with questions. We'll save time at the end for questions. But you may feel free to type the questions into the question field in GoToWebinar at any point throughout the presentation. And to save you some typing, Today's presentation is being recorded. A copy of the slides as well as a copy of the recording will be made available on PJR's website within the next couple of days. <clears throat> Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading certification bodies in the world. We have certified companies around the world to a variety of standards. While this list of countries is not all inclusive, it certainly speaks to our global presence as a registrar. Today we are discussing ISO 45001, but PJR is accredited to grant certification to a wide variety of standards. If you have an integrated management system, perhaps some of these other standards look familiar to you. Benefits of certification vary by standard by industry by location um, based on a number of factors some of the more common ones especially for a health and safety standard like iso 45001 include driving improvements to the organization's occupational health and safety performance in other words providing a safer environment in which to do business for employees to come to work, uh, things like that. So driving those improvements for occupational health and safety. It can also work to minimize risks of production delay, can drive improvements to management commitment and employee engagement levels, provide a framework for meeting legal requirements to which the organization may be subject, achieving strategic business management goals, such as stakeholder requirements, improving public image, providing a competitive advantage over organizations that don't hold a comparable certification that they can advertise. The standard is able to be integrated with other business management systems. Maintaining an occupational health and safety certification can also drive improvements to supplier health and safety performance levels. And there can be other financial benefits not mentioned above, including the possibility of cost savings on insurance premiums, depending on the industry, the location, and the insurance company. For anyone who is not too familiar with ISO 45001, the standard replaced its predecessor, OSAS 18001-2007. So that version of the standard has eclipsed. It's now ISO 45001-2018. The standard defines requirements for establishing, implementing, and maintaining an occupational health and safety management system. The acronym for that is OHSMS, and you'll see that through all my slides because that's a mouthful. The standard represents a framework for allowing an organization to control its hazards, to reduce its risks, including accidents, injuries, ill health, and or downtime, 
as well as driving continual improvement throughout processes and operations. It was published in March 2018, and it is a voluntary certification, meaning it is not a regulatory requirement in the U.S. or in uh, any of the states, as far as I'm aware, to maintain ISO 45001 certification. Being an ISO standard, it does maintain and adhere to the Annex SL structure that allows for easier integration between the ISO standards in that they follow the same format and use common terminology. Similarly, the ISO standards reflect common variations or very similar variations of the Plan Do Check Act model. The diagram from ISO 45001 is included on this slide to show how the different sections of the standard are intended to interact. Just taking a look at the standard at a high level, some of the key requirements of ISO 45001 include the, X, the Annex SL structure, which we discussed on the previous slide, an emphasis on leadership. There's even a whole clause assigned to the concept of leadership in ISO 45001 which is different than the predecessor standard OSS 18001, to really assign specific responsibilities to those in leadership roles, to help promote health and safety management within the organization, and to ensure the success of the system. For example, do the, um, are the resources allocated to the maintenance of the management system sufficient to ensure effective results? The standard at a high level calls for proactivity, and you see this reinforced through several requirements throughout the standard. There are expanded expectations for organizations to protect the health and safety of their workers as well as interested parties. The expectations for proactivity are found in a number of sections, including hazard identification, risk assessment, and operational controls, just to name a few. There's greater emphasis on risk management in ISO 45001, requiring the planning and determination of risk, both positive and negative via risks and opportunities, um, to take action regarding those identified issues. Again, that sort of goes back to the proactivity concept we discussed. There's also a focus on achieving intended outcomes. I have that underlined because it's a defined term in the standard, so we'll come back to that. There's also greater emphasis on objectives, measurement, and change to drive continual improvement. There's a shift in emphasis with regard to continual improvement from improving the management system itself um, to improving the, the health and safety performance of the organization. So that shift goes hand in hand with the proactivity expectations where we're not focusing on maybe creating another procedure or conducting another training just to say that we are making a change um, or adding something that wasn't there before to speak to continual improvement, but actually making changes that are going to impact the organization's performance. Those outputs are, for example, are the injury rates trending downward because of a change that was made by the organization, just an example. There are other communication and awareness changes, including equal emphasis on external and internal communications, whereas the emphasis was previously on internal communication. The standard separates awareness and competency requirements into two separate sections. This is another change from OSAS 18001. And the expectations for awareness criteria are more prescriptive than the previous version of the standard. There are overall fewer prescriptive requirements in the standard. And one 
such change relates to the term documented information. If you're familiar with some of the ISO standards with the Annex SL structure, this is one of the common terminology, uh, common terms that you see across those standards. So documented information is different than the verbiage used in previous versions of the standard documents and records that gives more flexibility to the organization to be able to determine what that will look like or what makes sense for their organization to try and stay abreast of modern media opportunities. There is increased prominence of the OHS management within the organization's strategic planning process and the standard introduces the concept of management of change which we will discuss in more detail shortly. I've included terms in the slides for you to review. They are found within the standard themselves as well. Um, the only one I wanna take a moment to go through is this one right here, uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Management System or the OHNS Management System defines the management system itself, but it has a note here that talks about intended outcomes. And we mentioned earlier, or I defined that term, um, so you could learn more about what that actually means. So the intended outcomes of the Occupational Health and Safety Management System are to prevent injury and ill health to workers and to provide safe and healthy workplaces. So when we see the term intended outcomes throughout the standard, it's really trying to make sure the outputs of those controls and the management system outputs are focusing on that um, intended outcome or that intent to prevent injuries, to prevent ill health, to make the environment safer for workers. If that is not um, in line with the changes that are being made, or that's not really the output, then we're missing the, the point, essentially. We're, we're not meeting the intended outcomes. Feel free to review these when you download a copy of the slides if that's helpful to you or they are found in the standard. Okay, <clears throat> clause four, we're gonna take a look you know, at some of the clauses themselves just to get a little bit more detail about the standard. Clause four focuses on context. Four point one drives the organization to understand the organization and its context. And this is as relevant to the intended outcomes. So this is what we were talking about earlier. What internal and external issues are relevant given those given the ability to achieve the intended outcome, so as relevant to the occupational health and safety management system. It's important for the organization through 4.2 to determine what interested parties are relevant to them, and we're not just talking about workers here. And then once those interested parties have been identified, what are their needs and expectations? Those can often translate to requirements. 4.3 drives the organization to determine their scope, the scope of the management system, and the issues and needs and expectations need to be included in that determination. Clause five is where we focus on leadership as well as worker participation. 5.1 talks about leadership and commitment, and it ultimately holds top management accountable for the effectiveness of the management system. If the management system is not effective, the responsibility lies with top management, not necessarily with a management representative or one person who was tasked with maintaining the system on a day-to-day -day basis. The occupational health and safety management system is supposed to be effective, thinking back to those intended outcomes. It's supposed to be integrated into the the business processes. It's supposed to be provided with adequate resources to be able to um, maintain the system, function properly, and again, achieve those intended outcomes. 
and communication regarding the need to conform to the expectations of the management system also ultimately lies with top management. If top management is supporting the expectations, that flows down. 5.2 covers occupational health and safety policy expectations where specifically the policy and the organization's objectives should be aligned with the organization's strategic objective and achieve the system's intended outcomes. We're also looking for a commitment to participation in the occupational health and safety policy. And this is, again, a defined term that you can get more familiar with what that participation means. Roles, responsibilities, and authorities were still in Clause 5, so we're still circling back or pointing all of this back to top management. A, a management representative is not explicitly mentioned anywhere in ISO 45001 because ultimately top management is to be held accountable. It's their responsibility to ensure adequate responsibilities and authorities are assigned, that responsibilities, while they can be delegated, it's still top management that's ultimately accountable for whether the system is effective or not. 5.4 covers participation and consultation of workers, both of which are underlined here because you can get familiar with what those terms mean in the definitions section of the standard. And this is an area of the standard that's a bit more prescriptive in the sense that criteria are listed in 5.4 to be included, to be evaluated, including training needs, um, identifying and removing any obstacles that might be in place to participation, emphasizing non-manager participation in consultation to really uh, reap the benefits of the employee's experience and allow them an opportunity to actively participate in the system. Clause 6.1 focuses on actions to address risks and opportunities. In general, we're working to determine any risks to the occupational health and safety management system given its ability to achieve the intended outcomes. So we see that term quite often. The intent is to prevent or minimize any undesired effects, including injuries and ill health, as well as to continually improve. The organization has to start by determining what those risks and opportunities are as related to occupational health and safety hazards, legal and other requirements, risks and opportunities that can affect the occupational health and safety management system's ability to achieve those attended, intended outcomes. The hazard identification requirements are prescriptive in nature, and here we see the need for proactivity again. The organization is to consider through its hazard identification process a number of factors. And I've listed them here because sometimes there are things that an organization may not think about right off the bat. They're probably thinking about their workers, but they may not be thinking about other individuals who work in the nearby vicinity who could be affected by the organization or people who are at the location at the workplace, but not under the control of the organization, still relevant to what we're trying to achieve here within the management system. Work areas and equipment designs could be relevant. Actual and or proposed changes affecting the management system are to be considered. We can learn from past incidents as well. And those are just a couple examples. There are requirements in 6.1.2.2 and 6.1.2.3 to have processes to assess those risks and opportunities. For risks specifically, we do need documented information as evidence. And again, this should be done with a sense of proactivity or a proactive purpose. Determining what legal and other requirements apply to the organization is, is required by 6.1.3. And this needs to be maintained up to date. It needs to be kept current. Those requirements can and do occasionally change. Not only do we determine what applies, we also need to determine how they apply. What does it mean for the organization? What does that applicable requirement mean they have to do? 
How does it affect their hazards and risks? Are there any associated communication requirements? These need to be considered when maintaining and improving the occupational health and ma ma health and safety management system. Excuse me. Six point one point four requires the organization to plan action to address risks, opportunities, legal and other requirements, emergency situations, uh, integration into the occupational health and safety management system, and evaluating effectiveness. It also needs to take into account when planning actions, the hierarchy of controls found in 8.1.2. To make sure you are not actually, for example, introducing another type of risk or you're utilizing a level of operational controls that is effective enough given the nature or significance of the risk. Retraining or documenting a work instruction can be very effective for certain types of risks and for other types of risks perhaps machine guarding or something more significant is really warranted. 6.2 focuses on objectives. 6.2.1 occupational health and safety objectives are to be identified uh, for improvement and they need to meet the requirements in 6.2.1 as summarized here. And then for 6.2.2, we're planning how those objectives will be achieved. And again, the listed uh, points here are prompts from the standard. We need to see documented evidence or documented information as evidence that these determinations or the, these planning activities have taken place. So for given objectives, what resources are needed? Who are the responsible parties? How will the progress be monitored? Things like that. Skipping ahead a little bit, competence is covered in 7.2. Competency requirements for workers that can affect the performance of the occupational health and safety management system must be determined. And then you also need objective evidence through documented information that those competency requirements are met. It's also required in 7.2 that if you need to bridge the gap between the current competency level and the competency for a given role, that whatever actions are taken to bridge that competency gap, those actions are also evaluated for effectiveness. For example, was training required? And if so, how was the effectiveness of the training verified? 7.3 focuses instead on awareness. And this section in the standard identifies specific things that workers need to be made aware of by the organization. Seven point four point three focuses on external communication. So we're not covering, and I believe I failed to mention this earlier. I apologize. We're not covering every single uh, clause. If there are not significant changes between OSAS eighteen thousand one and ISO forty five thousand one in a given clause, I'm tending to skip that here in the interest of time. So. I mentioned that in ISO 45001, external communication is given more emphasis than in the previous version of the standard. So the next clause we're going to look at is 7.4.3 that focuses on external communication. You need to determine the relevant internal external information and communication requirements in this section. This is who needs to be communicated with, by when is the communication due, how does it need to be communicated? What do you need to communicate? All of those concepts. Again, like we just discussed regarding objectives, it's not enough to set objectives. You also are required to spell out how the expectations apply to the organization and how they'll be achieved. 
external interested party views are also relevant or where relevant are required to be considered here as well. Documented information is covered in 7.5. We talked about how documented information gives a broader scope or more leeway for the organization to determine what types of uh, documents or documented information makes sense for them. There also needs to be a process or identified controls for how those are going to be maintained. How are they going to be created? How are they going to be updated? How will they be controlled? Clause 8 focuses on operations. 8.1 focuses on operational planning and control. This is the concept of having actions identified and established for the different processes to make sure the criteria are met. In this case, we're talking about occupational health and safety. So what actions or requirements are relevant to the different processes for the organization to ensure the health and safety standards are maintained, that the intended outcomes of the management system are adhered to, that the employees are being kept safe. 8.1.2 houses the hierarchy of controls, which is not revised or significantly changed. <clears throat> Essentially, I wanted to point out where in the standard you can find that hier hierarchy of controls when you're working to eliminate or reduce some of those risks and hazards. I mentioned earlier that management of change is introduced in ISO 45001. That is found in 8.1.3. This goes hand in hand with the proactivity we discussed earlier. And this is the concept where before a change is implemented, the possible impact of the change on the management system and the employees is reviewed for the opportunity to mitigate any of the any negative impacts uh, before the change is implemented. So rather than making a change and reacting to the impact it has on the management system, such as an injury or an incident or a near miss, the concept here is that it's going to be planned and discussed in advance to try and mitigate anything that could happen as a result. Some things to think about, some things that would be relevant to management of change could be uh, the introduction of new products, changes to the services or processes uh, performed at the organization site, um, changes to working conditions, even a, a move to a new building, changes to equipment being used, any changes to legal and other requirements could also possibly require mitigation. Changes to, um, let's see what else, um, workflow, changes to PPE. There are so many different things that we could consider here, but the concept is reviewing the impact it could have before the change is implemented to try and mitigate any negative impacts rather than reacting to them. 8.1.4 covers procurement. So we see general expectations for outsourcing in 8.1.4.1. We see contractors discussed in 8.1.4.2. So how will the occupational health and safety risks associated with the activities the contractors are performing how will they be identified and how are they going to be controlled? And this works both ways. This is two-way um, expectations for the organization's activities impacting the contractors as well as the contractors' activities impacting the organization's workers. This also needs to include criteria for contractor selection and a process to ensure that the contractor is meeting the applicable requirements as well. 8.1.4.3 requires controls be identified for controlling procured materials or outsourced services to make sure that, again, the management system requirements and the intended outcomes are being met. 8.2 covers emergency preparedness and response. There are some added 
or additional items that were not found in OSAS 18001. I've included some examples here. So you'll want to take a look at how your system, um, whether your system includes everything required compared to the, the predecessor standard. 9.1 covers monitoring and measurement. This is covered in a general sense in 9.1.1 to ensure that the expectations for monitoring and measurement are determined and documented. So again, we're talking the who, when, how, things like that, rather than a very high level expectation uh, without the planning being evident. 9.2 controls the internal audit expectations. 9.2.2 includes what is what factors are expected to be identified for the audit program and ensuring that the results are shared with relevant workers. So that's a change that I wanted to draw attention to for, for internal audits, skipping the rest of the clauses for internal audits because there weren't significant changes. Clause 9.3 covers management review. And again, as similar to uh, the previous slide, there are some additional items for the inputs and outputs of a management review compared to the list for OSAS 18001. So do review those. And again, we see an emphasis on top management accountability in that it is really important that top management participates in the management review activity. Clause 10 focuses on improvement. Uh, opportunities for improvement are referenced in 10.1. So again, we're talking about being proactive here. Opportunities for, for improvement are kind of the epitome of proactivity. 10.2 covers incident, nonconformity, and corrective action expectations. This section requires timely action be taken to address or correct incidents and or nonconformities as they arise. It wouldn't be appropriate to identify an incident has occurred and take six months to get around to investigating it. Corrective actions need to be reviewed for effectiveness and have evidence or documented information to demonstrate that those were completed. And again, we see a requirement here to share relevant results with workers as appropriate or interested parties as relevant. Continual improvement is discussed in 10.3, and we're talking about continual improvement of the management system, including the occupational health and safety performance of the organization. At the end of the standard, you'll find Annex A, which has some guidance on how to use the document, as well as a bibliography. We're not covering either of those today, but I did want to touch on a couple other related requirements that affect our ISO 45001 clients as well. There are two IAF mandatory documents cited on this slide. And while those requirements are relevant to certification bodies, they flow down to client organizations certified to ISO 45001. Overall, just like the ISO 45001 standard compared to OSAS 18001, these IAF mandatory documents raise the bar. They increase the expectations for an organization with a certified occupational health and safety management system. So some of the requirements found here that you'll also find relevant to your audits are the need to share significant changes with your certification body uh, in writing as soon as possible. So this means that waiting until your next audit several months later to tell us about a violation or a facility move do not meet the intent of, of the requirements here. There is a prescribed audit timetable that's required to be used to calculate audit time based on risk level and employee count. This is prescribed to certification bodies rather than created by 
each certification body individually. So while we are required to utilize that uh, time calculation uh, rule, so are all the other certification bodies. I mentioned that there is an emphasis on top management accountability, that it's important that they are involved in key portions of the management system, including the management review. Our third party uh, certification body audits are no different. So top management is expected to participate, make themselves available for the audits, especially for the closing meeting, which is arguably one of the most important parts of the audit activity where you are summarizing the effectiveness of the system, talking about its strengths, its weaknesses, going through any nonconformities that need to be addressed if any were identified, and so on. So if top management is not present for the closing meeting, we are required to document an excuse for their absence. And if there isn't a reasonable excuse, a finding against the top management expectations in the standard can be cited. <clears throat> Another requirement worth discussing is the requirement to include personnel responsible for monitoring employee health as part of the audits to be available for interview. Some companies utilize doctors or nurses for this activity. So it, the expectation is that they are also available to participate in the audit and be available for interview. Certification bodies can conduct special audits in response to compliance issues, incidents, and so on, and may even need to suspend or withdraw a certification. This is found in our terms and conditions as well. Legal compliance violations or gaps can possibly prevent or impede certification. This would be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the nature of the compliance gap and the actions taken on the part of the organization to bridge that gap. For anyone interested in initial certification for the first time, I have included a summary of that process and we'll go through that before getting to any questions you might have. The first step in pursuing certification to any standard is to get a copy of the standard. The documentation expectations should be implemented next to meet the requirements of the standard. Conduct any training that might be relevant. Implement the requirements of the standard itself, including conducting an internal audit, conducting a compliance evaluation, and conducting a full system management review. It's important to conduct the management review after those audits have taken place so that the outputs of the audits, the results of the audits, can be included as inputs in the management review. A contract with a certification body to conduct the audits is also required, so a certification body like PJR. <clears throat> the stage one and stage two audits would follow the actual audits to pursue initial certification. If there are any nonconformities identified, those would need to be resolved before a certificate could be issued. Once a certificate is issued, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that in a moment. The stage one audit is primarily a documentation review to ensure readiness for the stage two. Stage two, on the other hand, is a full system audit of the entire management system. All of the processes, all of the shifts would be sampled. Again, any nonconformities would need to be resolved before a certificate can be issue, issued. And once a certificate is issued, it's good for three years. The following three years consist of two years worth of a surveillance cycle, annual or semi-annual audits for those next two years, um, in which you'd have partial system audits, not all of the processes, not all of the shifts, shorter usually than a stage two audit. The third year of the cycle would be the recertification audit, which similarly to a stage two is again a full system audit and would result in 
a new certificate starting the three-year cycle over again once any nonconformities, if any were identified, have been closed. I included some information about integrated <clears throat> and simultaneous audits here, as we do see this sometimes apply, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave this in the slides for you to review if that is relevant to your organization. And if you haven't already typed in your questions, please go ahead and do so. I'm going to put my contact information up on the screen while we do that. So again, my name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Program Manager. I can be contacted via email or by the main PGR number put through to my extension if you have any technical questions about the standard or about the auditing process. If you are a current client, your scheduler can also answer questions about um, the general audit expectations. And if you are a prospective client, I've included the sales department number um, to get you started on some paperwork that would be required to put together a quote for you to get a sense of how long your audits might be and the costs associated with pursuing certification. Okay, let's see if we have any questions here. Okay, so we have a question about legal requirements for specifically in regards to 6.1.3. So we can go back really quickly to that clause and have it open. So the question is essentially, how would I go about identifying the legal requirements that would be subject to my business? Um, how, do I, how do I search for that? How do I get a complete list of compliance requirements? So this is an area where there's not really one website that can fulfill this for you or, or one way of doing it. The applicable requirements vary by country, by state, by industry, by number of employees. Um, so the OSHA regulations are a great place to start. Um, some states have requirements that differ from the OSHA requirements. Some have their own that supersede OSHA requirements, depending on your permits. If you have any permits as well, you could have some occupational health and safety requirements to adhere to, some, for example, industrial hygiene sampling requirements. Um, it really depends on so many factors. The types of equipment you utilize is, for example, uh, air quality a concern? Is noise a concern? Um, speaking just about occupational health and safety, I would say, you know, the OSHA website is, is a really good place to start. If you work with a consultant or a consulting group, they can also point you in the right direction. I'm trying to think what else. Sometimes your insurance company for general liability or workers' comp might have some resources that could be helpful to you. Those are my thoughts off the top of my head. Hopefully that's somewhat helpful. You're welcome, no problem. Okay, um, let's see. I don't see any other questions coming through. So again, let's go back to my contact information. Oops, sorry about that. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, but other than that, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available on PJR's website. I hope the contents of the webinar was helpful. We have a number of other webinars that we offer. So please feel free to tune back into another webinar in the near future. Thanks for joining and have a great day.